Welcome to LawPath's legal education videos. My name is Damon Murdoch. I've been a lawyer for more than 10 years. Today we're talking about a beginner's guide to the family discretionary trust. A lot of people hear family trust or discretionary trust. In essence, they mean the same thing. Just family trust is more the colloquial term for discretionary trust. And discretionary trust means it's discretionary in the sense that it's left to the trustee to distribute at the end of every year, which I'll talk to. I'll talk to you in greater detail about. Now let's look at what is a discretionary trust and who are the parties that are involved with that trust. There's someone called the appointer. There's someone called the trustee. There's someone called the settler. And there's someone called the beneficiary. The first one is the appointer. The appointer is the person who has ultimate control of the trust. What that means is the appointer can uh, remove or appoint or replace the trustee. Now the trustee is like your CEO of a company. Your trustee is the person that deals with the business day in, day out and makes decisions on behalf of the trust. So the appointer will have appointed the trustee to deal with the assets of the trust. You then have the settler. The settler is normally your accountant or your lawyer or whoever created your trust. That person has no interest in your trust except that they've brought it into existence. Normally, they're your lawyer accountant, but they can be anybody over the age of 18 who does not have any benefit and never will have any benefit in your trust. And then you have your beneficiaries. And those are the people who receive a benefit in the trust. So let's just look how this operates. A discretionary trust is a document. It looks very much like a contract and it basically spells out what the powers, duties, and responsibilities of each party are. The appointer can appoint the trustee. The appointer can remove the trustee. The appointer can change the trustee. The appointer can do X, Y, and Z. That's their powers of what they can do. They then appoint the trustee and it outlines what the trustee can do. The trustee can make a decision who to distribute the assets or who to distribute the profits to. So the trustee can choose to give beneficiary A some money and beneficiary B some different money. It's up to the trustee to decide how they deal with the assets. They could sell the assets, they could distribute money to their beneficiaries, whatever might be the case, or enter into contracts. Normally a trustee will be very, very broad in everything that the trustee can do and anything else that the trustee deems reasonable. And they ultimately have the power to deal with the assets of the trust. You then have the beneficiaries. There, there's named beneficiaries and non-named beneficiaries. Named beneficiaries are people who are actually named in the document, but they still have no right to any of the assets. The assets in the trust are owned by the trust and only if the trustee declares a distribution will the beneficiary be entitled to something. And only if the trustee declares that that beneficiary is entitled to something. Otherwise, the beneficiary has no right to any of the assets. The only right the beneficiary has is the right to ensure that the trustee is acting with a fiduciary, in a fiduciary capacity, acting in good faith, in the best interests of the trust generally. And that's pretty much it. And this is why it's called discretionary. So now let me get into an example of how it works, how it's established. You go to your lawyer, your lawyer says, I'll draft a trust deed for you. They say, who is going to be your appointer? You say, I'm going to be your appoint my appointer because I'm ultimate control of it. They say, great. Who's going to be your trustee? They say, well, I'm going to be your, my trustee because I'm going to have the day-to-day -day activity of the business. Great. Then they say, who's going to be the beneficiary? And you say, well, I'm going to be the beneficiary because I'm going to be one that's going to benefit from this trust. 
Your lawyer will then stop you and they'll say, the purpose of a trust deed is to protect your assets. It's to separate you from this pool of assets, this bank account. And therefore, normally, the same person should not be the appointer, the trustee, and the beneficiary. Because if they're all three, on occasion, a court can find that the trust structure is a sham, and at the, in, in reality, it's just you. Because you are the appointer, trustee, and beneficiary, and therefore there's nothing discretionary about it. It's your assets, and you're in control of them. And therefore, they can open up and defeat the asset protection that that trust is supposed to be giving you. So normally, you will make, maybe you as a pointer or a trusted family member as a pointer, someone as a trustee, someone else as a beneficiary, including yourself. Now, a trustee can be you or it can be a company. So oftentimes when you establish a family trust, you'll say, you the lawyer, you be the settler, me, I'll be the appointer, and I'll create a company, and I'll be the director of that company, and that will be the trustee. And the beneficiary will be me, and my brother and sister and mother and father, and all my cousins and relatives and everybody else as part of it. Because it's solely discretionary, you don't need to distribute to your grandparents or anything, but you can name them in it, but you don't need to distribute to them. And I'm not saying to include your grandparents in it, because normally that's, that would be more specific advice, but you would normally be putting your spouse, your children, and possibly your parents into your trustee as the beneficiaries. Now let's talk about how it actually works. It's this document, you've now created it, you're not in ultimate control in the sense that you're not the appointer, you're not the trustee and the beneficiary, but you've spread it around. You have different beneficiaries, including yourself. You have a corporate trustee potentially, and then you're the appointer. Then how does it actually work? Let's say you open up a company. It's a trading company. You can make your trust the sole shareholder of your company. So now, when your company makes a profit of, let's say, $100,000, it will then distribute that $100,000 as dividends to its shareholder. And the shareholder is the trustee holding the shares on behalf of the trust. And so the company has a $100,000 profit, they pay $30,000 in tax, and they distribute $70,000 down to the trust, who is the sole shareholder. Now there's $70,000 in the bank account of the trust, on top of the shares that it owns in that company that you're trading. Now it's time to distribute the assets, which is the capital earning that you've, or the income that you've earned from that, each year to the beneficiaries. And so who do you distribute to? If you're married and your wife's not working or your husband's not working, then you can distribute maybe 35,000 to yourself and 35,000 to your spouse. The benefit of this is that because the company has already paid 30% tax on it, this is what's called a franked dividend. Part of the tax has already been paid on the distribution. So when you get the 70,000, you don't have to pay the, your income tax on that 35,000. You only have to pay the difference between your income tax bracket and the 30% that the company's already paid. So if you're in the 40% tax bracket, for instance, or the 46% tax bracket, and normally you would pay 46% income tax on the money you receive, because the company's already paid 30%, you're only going to be paying 16% on that $35,000 that you've received. And your spouse will also only be paying 16,000 or 16% tax on that 35,000 that's being received. However, let's say your spouse doesn't work at all. Well, maybe you distribute $20,000 to your spouse because that's tax-free because it's a low income. 
And then maybe you distribute 10,000 to your child who makes uh, 10,000, maybe 10,000 to your other child for 10,000, and then 50,000 to yourself. Now you've just distributed the, the, the asset of the company, the income that the trust has just received between different people, bringing down the actual income tax because now you're only receiving 50,000. So now your tax bracket, or, or maybe you're only receiving 30,000 or, or whatever it might be, but you're receiving an amount lesser than the 70,000 that you would normally receive if you're the only shareholder. And so a family trust allows you to distribute income amongst different people, potentially reducing tax. But the other benefit is that the shares in that company are held by the trust. And so if every single year your trust distributes to you, every single year, year on year for 25 years, and then you get in a car accident and you forgot to renew your insurance, and as a result of you not resuming, renewing your insurance, you're sued for a million dollars. Your shares in your company are not held by you. Your shares are held by your trust. And your trust is a separate legal entity. So someone could come and sue you, and maybe they bankrupt you. But the shares in your business are protected because it's a separate entity. And now your trust, because you're bankrupt, decides not to distribute to you. And now they distribute to your spouse. And there's nothing wrong with that because you have never had a right to a distribution in that trust because it's purely discretionary. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up. If you have any questions, visit www.lawpath.com.au. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time.